sometimes fully on your face to learn how to get back up to pick yourself up the people that point me to Christ the people that journey with me the people that are not just signed up for when Jeremy's doing good and walk when Jeremy's doing bad for the people that are saying man I'm here when you're doing good and if you fall I still love you if you fall I'm still your friend if you if you fail I, I'm still gonna be here we're here in a journey together God is not looking for perfection from you. He's perfect. I'm entitling this uh, series, The Guardians Are Back. Someone say, The Guardians Are Back. Guardians Are Back. Uh, I want to read a few things. And um, I, I preached a series entitled this before, but we're going to go deeper on this. I really feel like this is a moment for us to step back into our rightful positions as sons and daughters of God, uh, to be the guardians of really the universe. Uh, that, that, that we are, you know, we know that uh, Christ rules at the center of everything. The Bible says from galaxies to governments, they're on his shoulders. And then it also says that at the center of Christ in Ephesians is the church. And so if we're a part of the church, we're the body of Christ, that's the church. We're the army of Christ, that's the church. We're the bride of Christ, that's the church. We're the family of God, that's the church. If we're a part of that church, anybody a part of that church here today? You know, you may not be ready to be a part of fearless church, the little C, but I'm a part of the big C. Maybe you're here a part of this, this church, say, this is my home, this is my church. But out of everything that Christ does, he rules the church. And so if the church is at the center of Christ, and everything else is on his shoulders, guess what's most important to Christ? His church, his bride. You know, I do a lot of things in my life. There's a lot of things I do. I'm, I'm a soccer coach. I'm, I'm a pastor of a church. I'm, I'm a, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a dad. I'm a, I, I, I'm a, I'm a creative. I make, I make trap beats. I'm a producer, uh, you know, in my dreams. I, I, I make clothing. I do a lot of things as a person. I, I, I like, I'm a foodie. We got any foodies out there? I mean, there are a lot of things I do. There are a lot of things, a lot of weights on my shoulder. I'm a provider. I'm a, I'm a comforter. I'm a, if my kids get sick or hurt, I'm, I'm, there's a lot of things that are, are weight on me. But at the center of, of my life, first is, is, is God, but, but really second is my bride, my wife, right? And so if that's the center of my life, Christ calls us his bride. So he's running a lot of things, but at the center of him is his bride. So, he, so you know, they have a saying in a house. When mama's not happy, nobody's happy. And so, so this, is, this is a saying that as men, as husbands, we need to, we need to hear our wives. We need to, we need to be uh, you know, responsive to our wives. And I can tell you this, this statement is true. But so, so these, this all comes, and this is all pictures for us of how attentive Christ is to serving the church to the, to the point where his service for the church, his bride, he served the church so radically that he died for her. And then the Bible tells us, husbands, serve your wife like Christ served the church. And so this, this is what we're to do as husbands. That's how we've been good husbands. But you can picture now how important the church or you and I as the body together are to Christ. And how important is this? How central is this to everything else? If the world is falling apart, it's because we stopped focusing on being the bride. And, 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 and the bride is the center. And so here we are. And so we are going to be guardians of this connection with God. We, and when we are guarding that, this is the simple, simple pretext of this whole series. When we are guarding our connection with God, then ultimately we are guarding the universe. Because out of the center of God is the church. Everything else results from that. And so as we come here, how important is it for us to gather, for us to not just attend, but for us to engage in this meeting right here? How important, all the things you did this week and all the things that you're doing in your life to be a good dad, to be a good boss, to, 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 to make it to where you're thinking of making it, in all of those things, 
How important is the connection that you have right here with each other and growing in Christ? And how important is it to take this into every day of your life if everything in our world hinges upon this? So I want to encourage you that you are called to be guardians of this. And, and as, we become, as we become aware of that, we can actually take up our rightful position as guardians of, of our relationship with God, our relationship with each other, of the church. And, and this is actually something that God has called us to. Now, I want to read you a few things. Acts chapter 20, 28 says, Take care and be on guard for yourselves and the whole flock. Now, we know the flock is talking about each other. Uh, which, you, which the Holy Spirit has appointed you. Somebody sh- uh, wave at your neighbor and say, you're appointed. He's appointed you as bishops and guardians to shepherd. And so and in parentheses it says to tend, to feed, and to guide the church, the Lord, uh, the, the church of the Lord of God, which he has obtained for himself, buying it and saving her for himself with his own blood. So God has called us to be guardians of the church, to be guardians of, 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 of the sheep that are in his pasture, to be shepherds. Now, this is not just a call to me. This is a call to all of us. We are all shepherding some pasture in our life. We are maybe shepherding family members or we're shepherding a home group or we're shepherding a relationship or we're shepherding our roommates. There are people that are watching your life, no matter how uh, you know, uh, shy you are or how loud you are, every single one of us in what we do have people that are either watching us close or watching us from afar. And God is saying, I want you to be aware of this, that you actually have been appointed to that. The people that are watching you are appointed to you. The, pe- the people that have chosen to see your life, it's not an accident that you are here at this church kind of following me and Christy. Or we went to Orange County, there was 40 people there. I'm like, where'd you come from? I mean, we're, we're hoping five showed up and there's 40 people. Well, I've been, I've been, you know, somehow I found the Instagram and from the Instagram, I found the podcast. And for two years, I've been listening to the podcast on my long drive to, to Pasadena. I happen to live right here. And I thought, well, I'm going to be this close. I might as well go hear it in person. That is me understanding that God is sending people around us supernaturally that are drawn to our voices, that are drawn to what God is doing in this environment. And if I'm not aware of that, I won't realize. I'll just think things happen and you're just here and hopefully you stay. No, you are called to this place. You were drawn to this place. And the more I catch that, the more I can steward that relationship and that guarding and that tending. God gives us three things that we're supposed to do as shepherds and as guardians. And it says this, it says to, to tend, to feed, and to guide. So this is our job. The people in your circle, the people that are drawn to you, the people that are hearing your voice, that younger cousin, that, that friend at school, that whoever you say, well, well, I'm not that much older in the faith than these people around me. Well, if you're one minute older, you're the leader, right? My daughter, she's, she's eight and my son's seven. And I say, Lyric, you're the leader. You're the leader. You were here first. You've been in this. You've been learning longer. You're the leader. Come on, lead like God has called you to lead. And these are the three things to tend to feed and to guide, to tend. The, the people in your life are going to get wounded. The people in your life are, are, are going are to have wounds that occur through this life. It, anybody that's ever had a wound occur in your life from just living, all you got to do is wake up and breathe. And guess what? The, how does a doctor find out if you're alive? He slaps you on the butt right there. When the baby comes out, they slap it on the butt. And what do you, ah! how, do, how do you tell if a baby's alive from the screaming that comes out? We come into this world screaming and we leave it smiling. Amen. This world is this world is a rough place. You're going to get some wounds. So it's our job to tend to wounds of those around us, not to not to lick wounds. Not to pour more salt in the wound, but to tend wounds, to remove what is hurting and add healing to that place. To remove what is hurting and add healing. This is our job. Not to encourage the hurting, not to leave them in the seat of the victim, to encourage them. No, this is not your home. You won't always be wounded. No, everyone's not going to hurt you like this. Come on, let's get healing. Let's be whole. Does anybody know some people in their life that have been wounded for the last 10 years with the same wound? Because they haven't attended to it. 
What happens in your body if you have a wound that you don't attend to? Infection, disease, problems. Okay, so, so we want to be, if we love people, we can't say we love someone and leave them wounded. Which we do all the time because we don't want to offend. We don't want to hurt. We don't want to say anything. Oh, we're, it's not our place. No, it's your place. God has appointed you to that place. Not to beat them down, but to help them up. Come on, how do I help someone up if I leave them in their wounds? When someone comes and says, man, I don't want to go to church because the last church hurt me. You say, well, that's, great. that's not great. I know that happened. I'm sorry that happened. But let me tell you, just because the last church hurt you doesn't mean this one's going to. You can say something like this. If you got food poisoning once, don't stop eating. Just don't go back to that restaurant. Move on. Find a place that you got to trust again. You got to believe. We got to be people that are willing to be shepherds. Come on, it's not just this. I can't shepherd your whole life. You got to be willing to be a guardian of the relationships in your life. And so tending. Come on, we're going to become tenders of the sheep uh, that's tending the wound, tending the pest, keeping the pest away, and maintenance over and over again, tending to the relationships in your life. Number two, feeding. God has called us to feed others. We're not just eating for ourselves. When I get in the kitchen and I start cooking, it's the most selfish thing I can do to cook some scrambled eggs and only make enough for me. My whole family sitting there. I'm like, oh, guys, awesome. Cooking it up. They're all smelling it, leaning over the kitchen. Wow, it smells nice in here. Awesome. What are you making, Dad? I'm making some eggs. Oh, awesome. Well, we can't wait. Oh, no, I didn't make enough for you. I only made enough for me. But, but we don't seem to think that way with the word. Man, we, we want, we're, we're not only reading for us. We're not only praying for us. We're receiving. There's enough in this that I can, there's enough eggs in the kitchen that I can make it for my whole flock. I can, I can, when, I'm, when I'm reading this, uh, when I'm praying, when I'm fasting, when I'm growing, I'm also doing it so that I can feed you. Uh, how can I feed you if I haven't fed myself? We have a whole bunch of anemic leaders that they, they stop feeding themselves and they only feed others. You gotta do both. You gotta be willing to feed you and also feed others. So this is pointing to people to things that actually feed them. Most of us spend our life eating things that don't feed us, eating things that don't add to our life. This is pointing to the water and the grass. This is pointing to the water. This is pointing, hey, I know this says this and that says this. The doctor's report says this, but let me let you feed on something new. He is a healer. He is a guider. He is a comforter. He heals the broken heart. I know, you, I know you've been feeding on what GQ magazine says about a broken heart, but let me feed you what the word says about a broken. We got to learn how to help people feed in the right direction as well. Amen? Amen. So, so this is why we have things like X18 in our church. If you don't know about it, we're going to be starting a whole new session coming up. But we go deeper on the word together. This once a week eating would not work for your body. So why do we think it works for our soul? Right? This once a week message. You know, it's just, it's just, it's just easy to think like that, right? I don't eat once a week. I'm hungry often. And some people are like... How are you hungry so often? You're going to like float away. But some people are, you know, I'm hungry often. And, and so we're hungry more than once a week. So this is why we have programs in this church and things in this church. Get involved. Don't just come to Sundays. It's great that you're here on Sunday. But if you really want to grow, if you really want to become a guardian, if you really want to be a keeper of the flesh, if you want to influence those others in your life, which I believe you're not here today if you don't want to do that. I believe you are here today on a mission to grow. I encourage you this next eight, X18, it's starting in like two weeks. Sign up for it. Get involved in it. We're we're going to be going through a book called The Blessed Life, talking about our finances and how to be stewards of that. How many of you guys would like to raise it up in your finances a little bit? Amen. And have God help you steward that. We're going to be talking about that. We're going to be going deeper on that. So we want to be guardians. We want to be feeding others and also feeding ourselves, pointing to the grass and the water, the things that matter, the truth that never fades. Amen. And then we want to be guides. If we're going to guide people, we're going to have to be willing to walk th with them through the mountains and the valleys to journey. I'm not just here with you for a day or two. Or I, I want to make the journey with you. If, if we're really going to be shepherds, we have to be willing to journey with people. This, this is the part of the process. 
with my kids. I have to let them fail sometimes. Let, let me, I always say it like this. Don't save someone from a fall that's going to teach them how to walk. Don't save someone from a fall that's going to teach them how to walk. Look, we got to start letting people in our life become mature themselves. As a pastor, people say, you know, hey, why did you tell us who to vote for and how to vote and how to do it? I say, well, because if I do, you won't become adults. I have to lay the scripture out and give you the opportunity. Who do, why do you not tell us who to marry and who not to? Well, because if I do, you won't become an adult. You have to learn how to, how to make some mistakes, how to do the right thing, how to do. You have to fall sometimes fully on your face to learn how to get back up, to pick yourself up. Look, I, I'm thankful for the people in my life that tell me what to do because I don't have to think around them. But I'm even more thankful in my life for the people who tell me who to go to for how to think. The people that point me to Christ. The people that journey with me. The people that are not just signed up for when Jeremy's doing good and walk when Jeremy's doing bad. For the people that are saying, man, I'm here when you're doing good. And if you fall, I still love you. If you fall, I'm still your friend. If you, if you fail, I, I'm still going to be here. We're here in a journey together. God is not looking for perfection from you. He's perfect. He doesn't need you to add to that part of the equation. He needs you simply to lean on him. Grace is opposed to earning, but it is not opposed to effort. Grace is opposed to, it's not your job to earn right standing with God, but it, you have to put in effort. Look, anybody can be saved. It doesn't take any work on your part to receive salvation. It just takes choice. I receive. You stand there in our church at the end. We'll say, do you want to receive salvation? Do you want to receive God rescuing you, renewing your life? No work on your part. You're like, oh, I raised my hand. Okay. In comparison to the cross, in comparison to the whip on his back, in comparison to the nails, in comparison to being dead for three days and going to hell and getting the keys to death, hell, and the grave, every sin you've ever done, every missed mark you've ever had, you mean really by raising your hand and praying a prayer, you really did something? No, I didn't do anything. I didn't lift a finger. God did all the work when I received him in my life. When I was 18 and I prayed that prayer, every miss, every mistake, every, look, that is the grace of God. That is the imputed right righteousness right standing with God he gave me instantly this is why when you come to God today if you're coming to God today you don't have to do a whole bunch to come to God you don't have to get a whole bunch cleaned up in your life well let me let me clean the house first no God wants to come in and clean the house for you God doesn't want you to clean the house because here's the deal you can't do a good enough job there's gonna be something there are certain pieces of trash that you can't take out they're too heavy for us to live my shame was too heavy for me to live my fear was too heavy for me to lift my missings of the mark my cursing God's name was too heavy for he came in and cleaned the house but here's the key after he cleans the house he wants you to be a part of living in the house salvation is free discipleship will cost you everything salvation is free discipleship will cost you everything I would I would I would have missed the mark for your life if we just rescued you out of the bushes and the wounds as your shepherd and not taught you how to grow and live and become and move forward, this is our call as the church to make disciples. God never says to make converts. He says over and over, go into all the world and make. He's done the work to make converts. It is the Lord that saves. It is God who redeems. If God doesn't need us to see someone say, he can rescue someone with an old lady at the gas station who never met the person. But God wants us to be a part of discipleship. He wants us to be growing and be grooming who he has called us to be. And look, if you are not walking out, you're called to be a discipleship. Why not? Start today. If you're not walking it out, you have no clue what gift God gave you. God gave us such a gift. Who am I to not use this gift of life for his glory? Who am I to look in the maker's face and say, thank you for taking all that. I'm going to go live my life now. No, I'm going to live the rest of my life 
saying, God, my life is yours. What I have is yours. Who I am is yours. I want to be a disciple. And so God is calling us to journey with people. To, to make disciples with people. There's people around you that you can help learn how to read the Bible. There's people around you that you can help teach how to pray. There are people around you you can pour into. Don't wait for the pastor to do it. You are, you are priests and kings. You, you have, God has given you authority in your environment. I'm never going to work in your job. I'm never going to be the, the, the cousin in your family, the brother in your fa- the dad in your family. You can't wait for your pastor to do it. It's your call it's my call to not just be discipled but to be discipling others and that means we're willing to journey with people that means we're willing with them not to be perfect all the time that means we're willing to let grace intervene that means we're willing to say come on get up again that means we're willing to be hated by someone who we have to challenge to move forward that means that we are willing to journey through the ups and the downs the the good and the bad you know everybody wants you to be your friend when you're on the mountain but look at who's around you when you're in the valley those are your real friends Those are your real fathers, spiritual fathers and real spiritual sons. When you're in the valley and they gather around you, those are the people that God has called you to journey with. And I know you're thinking of some people that have left right now. Sometimes we're so focused on the people that have left our lives that we miss the people God has put in our lives. We're so worried about who hurt us and who walked away. Let me tell you, if someone left and someone was removed, it wasn't you removing it. It wasn't that situation removing it. It was God that removed it. God was protecting you from a relationship that was taking from you but not giving back to you. There is something to say about the people that let the door hit them on the way out and start focusing back. Who's in the room of my life? Who is still here? Who can I pour out into? Who can I love tomorrow? Who can I lead? And who can I be led by? Amen? Amen? Amen. So God is calling us to be guardians. Come on, do we have any guardians here? The, the, word, the word guardian means to be a defender, a protector, and a keeper. The word guardian needs to be a defender, a protector, and a keeper. First Chronicles 9.24 talks about some guardians in the temple. It says the guardians were stationed on the four sides, the east the west, the north, and the south. God put guardians around the temple, around the house of God, around where he kept the presence of God at that time. There were guardians. There were actually certain generations of people that were assigned. Their only job was to be a guardian in the house, a keeper of the presence of God. Uh, an encourager of the presence of God and what they would do in, in, the, in the temple was, was there was a fire lit in the temple. In fact, the Bible, let me, let me pull this up because I want to make sure you see this in plain sense. Leviticus 6.13 says this, the fire must be kept burning on the altar continuously. It must not go out. So the guardian's job in, in the house of God was to keep the fire burning. Somebody say, keep the fire burning. Can, I, can you bring out that uh, fire? And, uh, and so their one job, you can let that, thank you, Chris. Their one job was to keep the fire go- burning. And God said, it must never go out. Your job, and Chris, you're just going to stay here. If this fire goes out, you're going to keep it burning. Okay? So you can just, you can, it might go out, I don't know. But, but your job is to keep that fire burning. Now, how, how attentive Chris has to be to this flame is how attentive the people of God had to be next to the symbol of the fire of God. Now, could God have kept the fire burning himself? Yes. But he asked man to be a part of it. He saved them. He rescued them from Egypt. And he said, my presence will be with you in the symbol of this fire. This, sim- this fire is the symbol of God's presence in your life. His hand on my life. You know, I'm blessed because his hand is on my life. You know, I'm, I'm healed because his hand is on my life. You know, I get to the front of the line because his hand is on my life. If I'm in the back, he chose me to be in the back because his hand is on my life. Wherever God puts me in every environment, I'm safe. I'm healed. I'm restored because his hand is on my life. So I want to keep God's hand on my life. And so this is what it looks like as a Christian. God lights the fire. He gives you the candle, but he says, all right, son and daughter, I want you to be a guardian of the flame. 
I want you to guard. No one else, no pastor is going to guard the flame for you. No, no other person is in charge. of the. You are in charge of being a guardian, a steward of the fire. And in the temple of God in this time, they knew that the fire meant they won wars. They knew that the fire meant that no one came on their land. They knew that the fire meant no pestilence can destroy their co- crops. They knew that the fire meant they were protected in the front, protected in the back, protected above, protected beneath. They knew that they could not fail because the fire was there and so one thing that someone would do all day all night for the rest of their generation for the rest of their city is they would keep the fire burning they, they would be stewards of the flame come on if if there is a darkness in, in la it's because we stop keeping the fire burning if there's a darkness in your workplace it's because we stop focusing on the fire look the enemy will do this over and over he said come look over here come look over here because there's a shiny thing over here you need to get involved in her come over here see see the enemy knows that if he comes at you with bad things he's lost because you're focused on the flame so what he does is he gets you to leave the greater for for something good it's good but it's not all what he promised but i'll receive it see we we are we are constantly uh, we are constantly getting distracted not by greater things but by good things the enemy doesn't bring negative things when he took jesus to the top of the temple what he tell him hey you know i'll give you all this if you do this, you can eat these stones and turn them to bread. The enemy did not fight Jesus with, with negative words. He fought him with good things. See, the things that mess me up are not what, what, I, what I do. It's what I shouldn't be doing anyways. The things that I picked up along the journey are the things that cause my fire to go out. God says, look, I want you to be a focus of the flame. There was a young man. His name was Samuel. Anybody ever heard of Samuel? The Bible says in 1 Samuel 3, 19, that Samuel had this gift on his life. The Lord was with Samuel. And as he grew, the Bible says that he would not let any of Samuel's words fall to the ground. This is the kind of prophet that Samuel became. He he was a man of God. He was a man of passion, a man of power, a man of authority. But he didn't start this way. He was on a journey. See, Samuel was a boy. And we can read this in 1 Samuel chapter 3. Right here in verse 3, it says, The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord. So he was, he was a guardian, Samuel. And he ministered in the Lord under Eli. In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. And there was not many visions. One night, Eli, his leader, his eyes had become so weak that he could barely see. He was lying down his usual place. And the lamp of God had not yet gone out, but it was a flicker. And Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord where the ark was, and the Lord called Samuel, and Samuel answered. So I, I want to I encourage you this. Samuel was a keeper of the flame. In fact, this is his only job in the temple. And the Bible says in his time, the word of God hitting their society was rare. People had stopped hearing from God. And, 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 and there was, there was the, 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 the fire that was once burning in the temple had become just a little flicker. It was constantly on the edge of going out. And Samuel, this boy, now you need to know about Samuel because his mom's name was Hannah. Samuel was her son and her only son. See, see Hannah was barren. She, she had no ability to have children. She, 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 she had tried... She had tried, she had tried, and nothing was coming about. And so in her time, it was a lot different than even in our time, not having kids. In her time, it was everything. Because it was her honor, her future, her dignity. It was, it was you were blessed the more kids you had. And so Hannah was barren. The Lord did not give her the ability to produce a child from her offspring and so she cried out to god the bible says and she gave, she made one of those promises with god i don't know if you've ever done one of those prayers with god you say god if you do this and then you add some crazy statement on the other side then i will give you every day of my life i will never run from you i will preach the gospel you know you, you make this big long list if you just do this it's the only thing you can well hannah does that with god she comes to god and said god if you would just give me a child Samuel, God, I will give him to you and he will serve you all the days of his life. She prays this crazy prayer and guess what happens? God gives her a child. 
she names him Samuel. And the word Samuel means the Lord gives. She names him. God gives her this blessing and then she holds up to her into the bargain. When the child turned one years old, she brings him. She nursed him until he, he, he was done nursing. And then she brings him to the temple and she lays him at the priest's feet. And she says, my child will become a servant. And I know we don't like this word and I don't like this word, but he will become a slave to this house. And she lays him down at the feet of the, of, of the priest Eli and she says he will serve this house all the days of his life and this is exactly what happened from the year uh, from from two years on Samuel was dedicated to the temple let's just picture Chris as Samuel and so he was given the job as a young boy the the priest had gotten tired of their job the priest's job were to keep this flame uh, going so they 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 handed it off to somebody else because it was a lot of work to keep the fire going it was you, you were going to lose sleep to keep the fire so they chose Samuel the servant of the house see God's looking for some servants of the house to keep the fire are going and I, and I don't care I'm, we're not waiting for pastors to do it we're not lead, waiting for leaders to do it we're going to be keepers of the flame in this great city and so Samuel's job day and night he lost a lot of sleep keeping the fire going he, he, he slept with one eye open keeping the fire going and the Bible says no matter how hard Samuel tried the fire in those days was just a flicker it's interesting that the Bible tells us that the fire was a flicker and the reason why I say that is when the Bible tells you something so detailed as that, it describes the fire so we don't miss what the fire was. You need to know if it takes a moment to say that, it is important. The Bible is really a small book in comparison to its topic. Wouldn't you agree? in comparison to the whole world and all there is about humanity and the solar system and the stars and history it's really almost like a pamphlet in comparison to its topic and so if the bible in the pamphlet form takes a moment to describe the essence of the fire that it, not that it was just there but it, that it was a flicker it's drawing us to understand more about the fire in fact i believe that the fire was the main character of the story and the Bible says that in those days, the word of God was rare. Visions didn't happen. And the fire was just a flicker. And the only person left guarding it was a small boy named Samuel. I wonder why he's trying to tell us that the fire was a flicker. Maybe the fire is a symbol of the priest of that time. Because if you research the priests that were in the temple besides Samuel, his sons, the Eli had grown old and he had gone accustomed, accustomed to allowing the sheep of his pasture to worship other idols. In fact, in the temple, there was temple prostitution. In the temple, there were other gods they had set up because when they went along and they fought other nations, they would take other people for their wives and their husbands and then they would allow their gods to enter into their house. And so now it wasn't just God being worshipped in the temple. It was, it was other gods. It was the God of Baal and these other things. So those things had slowly, maybe God's trying to tell us that in the temple, the fire was slowly dimming because the fire was no longer the main thing. The fire of the priest had slowly gone out. Maybe he was trying to tell us about the sons of the priest. Because although the priest attended the house and was a steward of the house, he stopped stewarding his sons. He stopped stewarding his fam family. This is why God tells us, your family is your first ministry. God, did, God and, then, and then many people use that to say, well, I'm not going to serve in the ministry because I just got my first ministry. No, God says, get your first ministry right so you can serve in the ministry. This, this is how it works. We are supposed to be stewards of our house, not one person here and one person at our house. We got to be stewards of it all. But maybe God was trying to tell us of the flicker between the priest and his sons. Or maybe God was talking about the flicker in the nation of Israel because once they had worshiped God, but now they were worshiping other things. It was just a flicker. Or maybe God's trying to remind us of the flicker in our lives. Has your flame ever become a flicker? I know for me, if I were to be honest, sometimes it's more of a flicker than ever a flame. I wish I could say different, but I feel like I'm constantly attending the flicker of the flame that I once had or wished to have. 
If I could be real honest, I would say today even that flicker has gone out at times in my life. That flicker has been exhausted. You know what we call this? We call it burnout. We were burning for him, but somewhere along the line we burned out. And now we're just attending the church and hoping that someone would ignite it again. The candle without the flame is robbed of its essence and its purpose. It has to sit in the darkness, it could change. Have you ever gone from burning in to burnt out as a guardian? Have you ever had to deal with the smoke of the fire that was once lit? I, I can tell you many times in my life, even pastoring, even preaching, I've become burned out. There was a time a couple of years ago where I had to take 40 days off of being the pastor of this church because I was burned out spiritually, emotionally, and physically. In fact, someone bought me a record and I could only listen to that record on repeat. It was from Brian and Jen Johnson. It was these studio sessions and that record would, would, would ignite that flame every morning again. And by the end of the day, I felt like it would go out all over again. I'd read my word and it would go out again. I remember being at the end of my rope in the bathtub trying to soak in Epsom salt because someone told me that would help me with my anxiety. <laughs> someone likes Epsom salt out there. And I remember that night it wasn't working. I was still feeling anxious, feeling like God had forgotten me, feeling burned out. And I started hitting the water to the point where I filled up the whole bathroom with water all over the bathroom. My wife heard me up there and she came up to see what was happening. I'd snapped. I don't know if you've ever snapped. If you've ever had an anxiety attack or a fear attack or things will never get better, but I had had it because I was tired of the flame being a flicker and burning out. And in that room, my wife came in and she just cried with me. She prayed with me. She started praying in the spirit with me right there. And she began to say after she said that, she said, God has greater things for you. God has greater things for you. Don't give up here. Don't give up here. Don't, don't lay down here. Don't stop here. You are a man of God. And I remember somewhere in my prayer, in my anger, in my almost, I'll just say it, I was cussing. I was mad. I was frustrated. Somewhere in my humanity, God met me. And all of a sudden, I began to pray in the Spirit. Something rose out of me in that bathtub. And something began to get ignited again. And I want to encourage you. I believe burnout happens when you get too far ahead of God or too far behind Him. When you get too far ahead or too far behind. See, I've found that if the devil can't get you too far behind, he'll just get you too far ahead. You say, what do you mean? Well, God gives you a word, and you're like, that's a good word, but you left out a lot of pieces. And so as human beings, we got to fill in the pieces. What do you mean? Like timing, like who it is, like when it is. How do I know that? Because we say, God, you promised me, but it didn't happen. Well, how do you know it ain't going to happen? Because we added timing. We added our own rhythm to the song. And God goes, my promises never fail. My words don't return void. And we get too far ahead of God. See, many times planning this church, I've gotten too far ahead of God. I started stepping into places that I thought God wanted me to do, and he didn't want me to do it yet. He didn't say now was the time. But I, I said, okay, God, I see it. Now I'm going to add to it. Thank you for doing your art. You, I see you left four things out. I'm just going to add my own colors to this painting. And God goes, oh, no, the, the beauty is in what I left out. Because when you get five more steps ahead, I'm going to paint that part too. I have enough to finish the product. But for me, constantly, I find myself as a dreamer in this place ahead of God. Many times in my life, I've also been behind God. God encourages me, stretch out your tent pegs, dream bigger. But, but it's the times I've gotten too far ahead of God that burned me out. And now I'm in his presence and God goes, okay, I want you to step with me. And then I wait. 
I know I heard you, but I'm nervous because of last time. And God's saying, last time you added 10 things to the story. Just as you, I wasn't up there, I'm not back here anymore. God is a moving God. In fact, the Bible tells us that there is a tree that is planted by the streams of water. And that tree never has leaves that aren't green never has moments that don't have fruit that tree is blessed in all seasons why is it blessed is it blessed because of itself no it's blessed because of the stream where it was planted god wants you to plant your life in him in him you can't burn out in him the fire remains in him but we got to be focused on the flame like chris is Every time I've snuffed it out, Chris lit it again. Every time I put it out, he was quick. He didn't wait on anybody else. He was quick with focus. This is the kind of focus you're going to have to have in your life to keep the flame of God lit in your life. The greatest of our faith. The greatest heroes, the revivalists that turned cities upside down, that saw arms grow back and eyes pop in people's heads, people that set cities on fire for the gospel of Jesus Christ, people like Reinhard Bunke, who when he would do an altar call, the, the lines were so big, people had to take buses to get to the front. People who saw dead people get out of caskets or people who just made it to the end. You know what they did over and over again? It wasn't their talent. It wasn't their smarts. It wasn't the things they touched on the outside. It was keeping the flame. I'm going to keep the flame of God burning in my house. I'm going to keep the flame of God burning in my life. And here's Samuel. And he was keeping the flame burning. It was a flicker, but it was burning. And it was kept lit in the house of God. See, here's the promise that I want to tell you. You know what the good thing about you right now, no matter how, how quenched your fire is, you came to the right place. Because the candle was burning in the house. It was flickering, but it was in the house. See, I'll tell you what, if you can keep your candle in the house, if you can keep your life in the house, that's why I'm saying Monday counts and Tuesday counts and Wednesday counts. Come on, get in the life of this church. Don't just attend this church. Engage in this church. Attending it will do nothing for you. Engaging will do everything in your life. You have come to the right place to have your fire lit because the candle inside the house had Samuel over it. See, in this house, there is someone next to you. When that fire goes out, they're going to light it again. I've found over and over again, when I put my life in his house, no matter how long it's been out, when I bring my life to the house, you could be years out and one second come in, and all of a sudden you get under this preaching, you get, get under this worship, you get next to a friend, or you say hi to someone at the front. It's weird how God will send someone to light your fire again. It's weird how one word from this book one song that sang and you put your house you put your life you come in dead and you come in dry and god sends a samuel god sends someone who is attending the flame god sends someone who's looking in your eyes that go come on man you're gonna make it through this come on man don't quit here come on can i pray for you i'm gonna be praying for you all week i'm gonna be saying words it's it's funny how just one word from god just one moment from god can go from darkness to light but samuel and the candle had to be found in the house i can't tell you how many times over the years one word from a mentor one word from a friend one word from a person who was attending our church. One, one word from God while I'm reading this. I can't tell you how many times where I've been in the house of God so dry, dragging myself to this place. Okay, God, I'm coming in one more time because I'm a guardian. I'm not giving up here. I'm not settling for dead flames. I'm not settling for burnout. I'm bringing my life. I'm bringing my family. I'm bringing my friends. And God, we're coming to the house. And God, I know in the house, God, you have put watchers in the house. You have put guardians in the house. God, light the flame again. Light the fire again. Do something, God. can't tell you how many times it's been one word from someone it's been one moment one encounter one song i had heard a thousand times but that time was different 
encourage you today, no matter what you do, find yourself in the house. Find yourself in this community. Find yourself gathered around, not fire quenchers, but fire starters. Find yourself around people who are using life to breathe over you. The people that leave, let them leave. But whoever drawn around you, let them speak into your life. The Bible says a wise man loves correction, loves people pouring in. Why? Because they get that every word is igniting that fire. Samuel and the candle were in the right place at the right time. And I want to give you encouragement today. You are in the right place at the right time. If your candle has gone out, come on, you, are, you still have, come on, you still have time left to ask God, use this day, use this moment, use this time to ignite something in my life. Again, there is more at stake. I got too far ahead of you, God. I added all kinds of pieces to the story. You know what repentance is? It's choosing different. It's turning from where you're going to where you need to be. This is repentance. Repentance is simply this. I changed my mind. I was set on this, but I changed my mind. And today I'm making a new decision. See, if you got too far ahead of God, it's only one step back. If you got too far behind God, Jonah. How crazy is Jonah went the wrong way. Tarshish means the other side. He hid himself a bunch of months amongst, amongst pirates heading the wrong way in the belly of a ship and God found him. And God didn't punish him once he found him. He's thrown overboard to his death. And what does God send? He sends a whale. Now many of you are like, man, God was mad so he chomped him with a whale. No, he was protecting him. He gave him a vehicle to get to his location. He was thrown over into his death, but God said, no, you still got a call in your life. You still got a destiny. God swallows him in the belly of a whale. He's chilling in a whale. He doesn't have a submarine. He doesn't have to pay a fare. He's chilling in a whale. I'm sure it wasn't comfortable, but he was in that whale. And the whale happens to spew him up in his exact location. He doesn't miss a beat. He doesn't miss a time. He gets there faster as if he would have went the right way the whole time. I'm telling you, if you've gotten too far behind God, what are you waiting for? give yourself back to him take one step back into the hands of God let him ignite the flame again if you're burned out you don't have to be burned out God wants to burn in you he wants to use your life to light this world you are the guardian of the flame don't wait for somebody else to come ignite your fire you are the guardians of the flame I'm waiting for some God. I wish someone would you'd send someone to love on me and believe in me. It doesn't matter if they believe in you. If you don't believe in the call on your life, how can they believe? Don't don't wait for somebody else. God wants to ignite a fire in you today. If you're in this crowd and you're feeling burned out on the inside, the flicker of the flame is barely there. The main thing has become the secondary thing. Or maybe it's all the way out. You say, God, I got too far ahead of you or I got too far behind you. God, I want you to ignite that fire again in 2020, before next year. Why wait till 2021? We're going to light it in 2020 and we're going to let it burn all the way into next year. Come on, if you're going to be a guardian of the flame, if you're going to be a keeper of the flame, you say, man, I've been burned out. I've been going through. Something. I just want you to lift your hands, man. I've been burned out. I got too far ahead of God. I got too far behind God, but I'm in the right place. God, here I am. Ignite my fire again. Ignite my flame again. I got, I got, I got serving fatigue. I've been serving. I've been loving. I've been doing, but Lord, it's not the same as it used to be. God, I want that fire again. I want that super meeting this natural all over this place. Jesus, we just ask, come on, if you want to keep that fire burning, I just want you to lift your hands. You say, my fire is burning, but I want to be a keeper of the flame. I want to be a guardian. I want to be a protector, a steward of that fire. I don't want to miss things God has for me. I want to stay in the center of his will. The Bible says, if you get into him, he's the vine, he's the vine, you're the branches. If you get in him, you can produce much fruit. God, I want to be plugged into you. 
every part of my life. I want to be a guardian. Holy Spirit, we ask for your fire once again. All right, it's time to worship God through our giving. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It's a first example of extreme, extreme generosity. Um, he didn't, for God so loved the world, he didn't take, he didn't keep, but he opened up his hands and he gave. He gave his only son. Um, that, that's an example worth a million words, which you should go, hey, from that example, I don't need any more. I can just go give uh, with my life, with my finances, with my treasure. And that's how we should do with that posture is just continue to be generous. But I love that we are continuing to recklessly uh, uh, give with, with massively. Like it's, it's been so cool to see uh, the thousands of people that are prayed for and are thanking us for thinking of them during this time. So I just wanna tell you church uh, to continue to give, continue to um, partner with us in reaching our city. We could. What what could happen uh, uh, if all of us gave? What could happen? The, the possibilities are endless. And, and there's a lot of great dreams for the city. But if we could all just come together, not only pray, but put some action to that prayer, uh, we could see the impossibilities become possibilities. I encourage you today, let's give. Give in your lack, even in your plenty, but also give in your lack. We don't give because we're, we're going by our emotions. We shouldn't be emotional givers or we should be giving because it's a truth in the word of God. We do it no matter what. And he's going to bless you. He's going to bless you. So let's go ahead and give. Hey guys, thank you so much for tuning in to Fearless Online. Again, if this is your first time joining us, we would love to say welcome. So be sure to text the keyword fearless to our fearless number. Church, we love you guys. You are absolutely incredible. Have an incredible rest of your Sunday. <laughs>